latest on findings being published in a new book out today on the Shroud of Turin. That's the linen cloth believed to bear Jesus's imprint as he was being prepared for burial. And now there's new research that may disprove the claim of people who've said it's an elaborate fake. Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is indeed a fascinating artifact that has sparked considerable debate and interest over the centuries. While many believe it to be the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, others approach it with skepticism, citing various scientific analyses and historical considerations. The discovery of the faint image on the shroud, particularly its clarity and photographic negatives, has intrigued scientists and believers alike. The three-dimensional details apparent in the image have also puzzled researchers as they seem to surpass the capabilities of medieval artists. Additionally, the documented history of the shroud adds to its mystique and allure. The revelation of the rare stitch on the back of the shroud, linking it to the Masada fortress in Israel, provides an intriguing archaeological connection. This connection adds another layer to the debate surrounding the shroud's authenticity aligning it with historical events and locations relevant to Jesus' time. The depiction of wounds consistent with Roman scourging and crucifixion on the shroud further fuels the belief that it could indeed be the burial cloth of Jesus. The presence of blood and clear fluid on the cloth, particularly around the chest wound, adds to the complexity of its narrative. Join us today as we delve deeper into the enigmatic tale of the Shroud of Turin, a relic shrouded in mystery and controversy. Uncover the secrets hidden within its faint image and explore the fascinating journey of this ancient artifact. We'll unravel the intriguing connection between the shroud and the historical events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion. Discover the latest scientific findings and archaeological insights that shed light on the authenticity of this revered relic. Subscribe now to our channel to unlock access to this captivating exploration of the Shroud of Turin. Don't miss out on the opportunity to join the conversation and engage with fellow enthusiasts as we delve into the mysteries of this sacred artifact. And as you watch, ponder these thought-provoking questions. 1. What implications does the unique stitching pattern discovered on the back of the Shroud have for our understanding of its origin and journey? 2. How do modern scientific analyses, such as carbon dating and forensic examination, shape our perception of the Shroud's authenticity and significance? Let's delve in. Shroud of Turin, an archaeological evidence that proves the Bible. The Shroud of Turin, also called the Holy Shroud, is a piece of linen cloth depicting a faint image. It has been revered for centuries as the authentic burial shroud that was used to wrap the body of Jesus of Nazareth after his crucifixion, and on which an image of Jesus' body was miraculously imprinted it. 1898, Second Pier produced the first photographs of the shroud, which showed that the human image on it can be seen more clearly in a black and white photographic negative than in its natural sepia color. This discovery is still relevant today, as it helps in better understanding the Shroud and its features. The Shroud has a documented history dating back to 1354, when it was exhibited in a church in north-central France. Amazingly, this negative image possesses 3D details that go beyond the capabilities of paintings, botanical and DNA connections. In a pivotal moment of revelation in 2002, conservation efforts in Italy unveiled a hidden secret. The removal of the 16th century backing cloth exposed a rare type of stitch on the back of the shroud, a stitch known only from one other place, the Masada Fortress in Israel. This archaeological connection adds layers of authenticity to the shroud story, as Masada was a witness to the Jewish revolt, aligning with the historical timeline of Jesus. The Shroud's narrative, the presence of multiple wounds consistent with Roman scourge marks on the cloth match, lead balls from a whip. There's a wound on the chest, with both blood and clear fluid, 
suggesting the heart stopped beating. The shroud's journey is not just about what's on it, but where it's been. The agony and burial of Jesus through the Shroud of Turin. As we dive deep into the story depicted on the Shroud of Turin, we are transported to the harrowing moments leading to Jesus' crucifixion. Before the final act of sacrifice, Jesus endured a brutal and dehumanizing series of torments, each excruciating detail etched into the fabric of the Shroud. Stripped and subjected to a merciless flogging, the flagrums used were tipped with both blunt and sharp objects, tearing into his flesh and reducing it to shreds. The agonizing process left the body battered and covered in wounds. To intensify his sufferings, soldiers fashioned a crown of thorns, not delicately woven but hastily twisted from branches. After this merciless display of brutality, Jesus now bearing the weight of his own cross, was dressed in his blood-stained garments and forced to carry the 150-pound burden. Despite the pain and loss of blood, he struggled forward each step a grueling journey. The wooden cross dug into his shoulder, exacerbating the wounds from the flogging and inflicting additional torment as it banged against the thorny crown, sending sharp stabs of pain into his head. It is difficult for most of us to anticipate a major incident let alone a scourge. Let us see what caused that much detail to show up on the Turin. Tripping and falling under the immense weight of the cross, Jesus endured yet another wave of suffering. The impact crushed his chest against the ground, twisting his arm and wrenching it severely out of its socket. The cross, now atop him, pressed into the back of his neck and shoulders, partially paralyzing him. His head sagged to the right, rendering his right side useless in the state of agony. Heartless soldiers callously pulled him up by his dislocated arm, forcing him to continue the journey with the cross now on his left shoulder. Bent over in pain and weakness, his right arm hung helplessly by his side. The staggering steps forward were a testament to his resilience amidst unimaginable suffering. As we reflect on these vivid details imprinted on the Shroud of Turin, the narrative unfolds with stark realism. Each mark, each wound, tells a story of unparalleled sacrifice and suffering. The Shroud, like a silent witness to these agonizing moments, invites us to contemplate the depth of Jesus' sacrifice and the profound love that compelled him to endure such brutality for the sake of humanity. In the end, the Shroud not only preserves the physical remnants of this crucible of pain, but also serves as a powerful testament to the resilience of faith and the enduring message of hope that emerged from the darkest hours of human history. Another question is, who originally owned this cloth? Did Jesus pay for his burial, or was there someone else? Keep watching till the end, and we will cover this. The Crucifixion and Burial on the Shroud of Turin As we approach the culmination of Jesus' journey, the Shroud of Turin vividly captures the heart-wrenching scene on Golgotha. His clothes, now soaked with blood, were mercilessly ripped from his body, reopening wounds that had started to adhere to the fabric. Helplessly thrown onto the cross, the soldiers proceeded to nail his already distorted and dislocated right arm, causing excruciating pain as nerves and ligaments were severed. When Jesus' body reached the tomb, it was placed on a bed of perfumed spices. The headcloth was removed and the shrewd was folded over him loosely wrapped with a thin strip of linen. This gentle yet hurried burial was necessitated by the impending Sabbath. His lifeless form, wrapped in pure linen, was left in the tomb, the entrance sealed with a rolled stone. Description The shroud is a rectangular piece of cloth that measures approximately 4.4 by 1.1 meter, 14th 5 inches by 3 feet 7 inches, and is made of flax fibrils woven in a 3 to 1 herringbone twill pattern. The most distinctive feature of the cloth is the faint, brownish image of a man seen from the front and back. On the cloth, there is an image of a man with a beard, mustache, and shoulder-length hair parted in the middle. 
He appears muscular and tall, with various experts measuring him as between 1.70 to 1.88 meters, 5 ft 7 inches to 6 ft 2 inches. In 1532, a fire broke out in the chapel located in Chambéry, France, causing damage to the shroud. The linens suffered burn holes and scorched patches on both sides due to contact with molten silver, which burned through it in some areas while it was folded. To repair the damage, nuns sewed 14 large triangular patches and eight smaller ones onto the cloth. Conservation The shroud has undergone several restorations to preserve it and prevent further damage and contamination. It is stored in an airtight case made of laminated bulletproof glass. The case is temperature and humidity controlled to prevent chemical changes. The shroud itself is placed on an aluminum support that slides on runners and is stored flat within the case. According to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, Joseph of Arimathea wrapped Jesus' body in a linen cloth and laid it in a newly built tomb. However, the Gospel of John suggests that strips of linen were used for the same purpose. Joseph of Arimathea was a biblical figure who played an important role in the burial of Jesus Christ. His account can be found in each of the four Gospels, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19, Mark chapter 15 verses 42 through 46. When evening had already come because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent and respected member of the Council Sanhedrin Jewish High Court, who was himself waiting for the Kingdom of God, and he courageously dared to go in before Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, only six hours after being crucified, and he summoned the centurion and asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that Jesus was in fact dead, he gave the body to Joseph by granting him permission to remove it. So Joseph, bearing the name of his hometown, Arimathea in Judea, to distinguish him from others, procured a fine linen cloth for the solemn task of wrapping Jesus' body. With care he descended the cross and tenderly enveloped the lifeless form before placing it in a rock-hewn tomb. A large wheel-shaped stone sealed the entrance, marking the beginning of Jesus' entombment. Though the biblical accounts provide sparse details about Joseph of Arimathea, they offer glimpses into his character and actions. Luke 23-50 identifies him as a member of the Jewish Council of Sanhedrin, the body responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. Yet, verse 51 uncovers his covert allegiance to Jesus despite his outward affiliation with the Council. Mark 15.43 echoes this sentiment, as noted in Matthew 27.57, adds another layer to his persona, though its origins remain obscure. Nevertheless, the Bible portrays him as a man of integrity and virtue, Luke 23.50. Following Jesus' crucifixion, Joseph undertook a daring mission, approaching the Roman governor Pilate to secure Jesus' body. Accompanied by Nicodemus, another figure with a clandestine interest in Jesus, Joseph obtained permission to prepare the body for burial. In accordance with Jewish custom, they meticulously wrapped the body in linen strips infused with myrrh and aloe. However, time was fleeting. As they toiled on the eve of the Sabbath, the day of preparation, before the onset of Jewish Sabbath rest, so Joseph and Nicodemus quickly placed Jesus in Joseph's own tomb which was located in a garden close to the place of crucifixion. Joseph and Nicodemus were unaware that they were fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy by placing Jesus in Joseph's tomb. The prophecy stated that he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 this is just one of many prophecies that serve to confirm Jesus' identity as the Messiah and Son of God. According to the Gospel of John, Simon Peter entered the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and found strips of linen along with the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. 
The cloth was still in its place, separate from the linen. However, in the Gospel of Luke, it is mentioned that Peter ran to the tomb and saw the strips of linen lying by themselves while bending over Jesus' suffering. Did not just start at the cross, the way to Jerusalem. These events took place roughly a week before Jesus was crucified. He knew he was headed to the spot where he would die, placing himself on Calvary's altar as a sacrifice for sin. The disciples were nervous, and they had a sense of foreboding in the air. Although Jesus had previously stated that he would die, they were unprepared for this message. They didn't want to hear Jesus talk like that. They had visions of an earthly kingdom. On the road to Jerusalem, we encounter Jesus alone with his thoughts, and the disciples are taken aback. Then, as the crowd grew larger, they became terrified Jesus needed to say something encouraging, a sorrowful prediction. Mark chapter 10 verses 32 through 34. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were perplexed at what Jesus had said, and those who were following were alarmed and afraid. And again he took the twelve disciples aside, and began telling them what was going to happen to him, saying, Listen very carefully. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, Romans. They will mock and ridicule him and spit on him and whip, scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise from the dead. Jesus said he would be betrayed, sentenced, and executed. Matthew chapter 8 verse 31 And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and must be put to death and after three days rise from death to life. He had warned them that this would happen. The word that jumps out in that statement is wood. Jesus spoke about the necessity of his cross. Mark chapter 9 verse 31 Because he was teaching his disciples and preparing them for the future. He told them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed and handed over to men who are his enemies, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise from the dead. Three days later he mentioned his death again, but this time he used the term will as he described what would happen to him. The emphasis was on the cruelty of the crucifixion. When Jesus made these prophecies, he was completely in control. Jesus handled his death in a way that we cannot. We understand that death is unavoidable, but we have no idea when, where, or how we will die. Jesus was fully aware of his death at Calvary. Instead of becoming a victim of circumstance or a martyr for a cause, Jesus was determined to pass. No one takes my life, but I lay it down of myself, he told the followers. John chapter 10 verse 18, no one takes it away from me, but I lay it down voluntarily. I am authorized and have power to lay it down and to give it up, and I am authorized and have power to take it back. This command I have received from my Father. Mark chapter 10 verses 33 through 34 saying, Listen very carefully. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, Romans. They will mock and ridicule him and spit on him and whip scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise from the dead. Jesus also predicted that he would be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes, the religious authorities of the day, and would condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They would insult, scourge and spit on Jesus, he predicted. That's exactly what they did. At the end, Jesus foreshadowed his own resurrection. For some reason, this passed right over the disciples' minds. They never seemed to hear that Jesus would rise from the dead. The resurrection continues to astound everyone, including many Christians. Despite all of this, Jesus rose from the grave three days later. Jesus is as alive today as he was when he arose from the tomb. 
a shameful ambition. Every time Jesus mentioned the cross, another spiritual defect in these disciples' life was revealed. But that's what the cross does. It reveals the human heart, showing us how self-centered we are. In Mark 10, 35, 36, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus with a bold request. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Intrigued, Jesus inquired about their desire. Matthew's account adds that their mother, Salome, was behind their plea, seeking positions of honor for her sons in Jesus' kingdom, Matthew 20, 20, 21. Their ambition was clear, to secure prominent places of authority, one on Jesus' right and the other on his left, in his future glory, Mark 10, 37. This request reflected their desire for prestige in Jesus' kingdom, yet Jesus saw beyond their ambition. In Mark 10, 38, he questioned their readiness for the responsibilities that came with such positions. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus was alluding to the suffering and sacrifice he would endure, symbolized by the cup of agony he would drink at Calvary, John 18:11. Despite their initial confidence, Jesus foretold that James and John would indeed share in his suffering and baptism of mission, Mark 10, 39. Their response echoes our own eagerness to follow Christ, often fixating on the glory while overlooking the challenges. Yet Jesus reminds us that true discipleship entails embracing both the joy and the trials, following his example of sacrificial service and obedience, John 18:11. Just as Jesus challenged James and John, he challenges us to consider the full implications of discipleship. Are we willing to endure hardship and sacrifice for the sake of his kingdom? The lesson from their encounter resonates with all believers, reminding us that the path to glory often traverses through trials and tribulations. Mark 10 40, 41 reveals Jesus' response to James and John's request for positions of honor. But to sit on my right or left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. The news of this conversation left the other ten disciples indignant, as they too desired such positions. This incident occurred just a week before Jesus' crucifixion, with his disciples preoccupied with thoughts of power and glory, rather than grasping the imminent sacrifice. As Jesus approached the final days before his crucifixion, his focus was on Jerusalem, where he would willingly identify with humanity and serve others selflessly. He gathered his disciples to impart a crucial lesson on true greatness, highlighting the stark contrast between his ways and the world's expectations. First, Jesus demonstrated his willingness to identify with humanity. Second, he emphasized the importance of serving others rather than seeking personal glory. Third, Jesus clarified his ultimate purpose, to offer his life as a ransom for many, paying the price for their release. The concept of ransom beautifully encapsulates Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, dispelling the misconception that his journey to Calvary was easy. The Gospels recount Jesus' overwhelming sorrow in Gethsemane, where he faced the prospect of excruciating death humiliation, and insults. The innocence of Jesus, an innocent man dying for others, is vividly portrayed in these accounts. Jesus' prayers in Gethsemane, particularly, let this cup pass from me, revealed his complete surrender to God's will before the crucifixion. The metaphorical cup symbolized the bitter suffering he was destined to endure, presenting a deep internal struggle. When Jesus asked his disciples if they could drink the same cup, they confidently replied, We are able. However, Jesus, aware of the depth of suffering, warned them to stay vigilant against temptation, acknowledging the weakness of the flesh. In the midst of Jesus' internal struggle, he expressed deep grief and sorrow, showcasing his full humanity. His foreknowledge of the impending events did not diminish the emotional and physical toll he experienced. This profound moment in Gethsemane underscores Jesus' humanity, 
and the immense sacrifice he willingly embraced for the redemption of many. Mark chapter 8 verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and must be put to death and after three days rise from death to life. The torment that he was going to go through was going to be more than just physical. It was also going to be mental and spiritual. Jesus was aware that it was God's plan for him to be crucified, that God wanted him to be pierced for our transgressions and wounded for our healing. Jesus knew that this was the will of God. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 5 through 7, but he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus loves mankind, but his humanity dreaded the pain and sorrow he faced, and it drove him to ask his father, let this cup pass from me. The phrase, let this cup pass from me, appears in Jesus' prayer, and it contains two significant qualifications. To begin, he utters the prayer. If it is possible, Jesus implores his father to let him choose an alternative path to redemption for humankind, if one exists. Jesus did not want to die, but he followed the will of God. The events that occurred after he prayed demonstrate that there was no other way. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the only one that could possibly redeem the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Second, Jesus prays, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was committed to the will of God, body, mind, and soul. The prayer of the righteous is always dependent on the will of God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus exemplified the victory of the Spirit over the flesh by wholeheartedly submitting to God's will. When we face challenging times, we find solace in knowing that Jesus empathizes with our struggle to align our desires with God's will. This internal conflict is a natural aspect of being human, one that Jesus, our Redeemer, fully understood and experienced. In Hebrews 2.17, we learn that Jesus, in his humanity, shared our experiences to become a compassionate high priest. He fulfilled his mission of seeking and saving the lost, despite enduring suffering until the end. His prayerful communion with God during this tumultuous time reflects a deep, intimate relationship. During Jesus' agony in the garden, an angel appeared to strengthen him, signifying heavenly support during difficult times. Despite facing rejection and death, Jesus prayed earnestly, laying his burdens before God. This portrayal humanizes Jesus, revealing his capacity to comprehend and empathize with our struggles. Hebrews 4.15 assures us that Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses, having experienced temptation yet without sin. His character and example demonstrate how we can confront life's trials while relying on God's strength. Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane exemplifies a profound submission to God's will amidst intense emotional turmoil. Jesus' prayer was marked by honesty, humility, and emotional depth contrasting with our often superficial approach to prayer. True prayer demands sincerity and effort, qualities embodied by Jesus in Gethsemane. Rather than merely going through the motions, 
Jesus engaged in authentic dialogue with God, expressing his deepest emotions and fears. Luke, a physician, highlights Jesus' sweat resembling blood drops, likely a result of hematidrosis induced by extreme stress. This physical manifestation underscores the intensity of Jesus' anguish and agony. His vulnerability in this moment reveals the depth of his humanity and the severity of his impending sacrifice. Jesus' prayer demonstrates his unwavering commitment to God's will, even as he pleaded for an alternative path. Despite the silence that followed, Jesus resolved to follow God's plan, receiving strength from heaven to fulfill his calling. This passage illustrates the profound union between submission to divine will and the divine strength provided. In facing the trial of the cross, Jesus exhibited remarkable traits, including honesty, humility, and reliance on God. His example inspires us to persevere in prayer and seek God's guidance amidst life's challenges. Through Jesus' humanity, we find reassurance that God understands our struggles and offers strength in times of need. The journey through Gethsemane offers valuable lessons, reminding us of the importance of spiritual battles, the comfort of divine presence, and the necessity of submission and strength received through prayer. Jesus' sacrifice on Golgotha, though shrouded in mystery, stands as a beacon of hope and redemption, symbolizing God's profound love for humanity. As we reflect on Jesus' journey from Gethsemane to Golgotha, let us remember the significance of his sacrifice and the assurance of salvation it offers. Though the exact location of Golgotha may remain uncertain, its spiritual significance remains unwavering, serving as a reminder of Jesus' ultimate victory over sin and death. Jesus' death on the cross, symbolized by Golgotha, represents the culmination of God's plan for redemption. His sacrifice, the only one capable of forgiving sin and reconciling humanity with God, offers hope and salvation to all who believe. As we contemplate the magnitude of Jesus' sacrifice, may we find comfort and assurance in his love and grace. The distinctive stitching pattern discovered on the reverse side of the Shroud of Turin presents a compelling avenue for enhancing our comprehension of its origin and historical trajectory. This unique feature not only showcases the craftsmanship employed during its creation, but also offers a potential geographical and cultural fingerprint. By subjecting the stitching to meticulous analysis, experts can glean insights into the historical context, contributing significantly to the ongoing discourse surrounding the shroud's authenticity. In the realm of textile craftsmanship, the stitching pattern emerges as a critical facet for discerning the origin of ancient artifacts. The intricacy, style, and techniques employed in the creation of such stitching provide a nuanced lens through which the cultural and geographical roots of the shroud can be unraveled. This stitching, like a distinct signature, carries the imprint of historical practices enabling experts to draw parallels with known traditions and methods prevalent during the period associated with the shroud. The stitching pattern becomes a veritable time capsule, offering a glimpse into the textile artistry of the era in question. The intricacies of the stitches, the choice of materials, and the overall composition can be scrutinized against the backdrop of historical textile practices. This analysis may reveal regional variations or cultural idiosyncrasies that align with specific locales or traditions. Consequently, the stitching pattern acts as a pivotal clue, guiding researchers in their quest to unlock the mysteries of the Shroud's origin. Beyond its role as a cultural signifier, the stitching pattern assumes even greater significance when considered in the context of the Shroud's historical journey. This artifact, purported to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, has a documented history dating back to the 14th century when it was publicly exhibited in a church in north-central France. However, the discovery of the unique stitching pattern on the back of the shroud introduces a new layer of complexity to its narrative. 
One pivotal moment in the Shroud's historical revelation occurred in 2002, during conservation efforts in Italy. The removal of a 16th century backing cloth exposed a stitching pattern on the back of the Shroud that bore resemblance to a stitch known from another historical site, the Masada Fortress in Israel. This archaeological connection, linking the Shroud to Masada, adds layers of authenticity to its story, aligning it with a historical timeline that coincides with the life of Jesus. The implications of this stitching pattern for the Shroud's journey become more pronounced when considering the socio-political context of Masada. The fortress was a witness to the Jewish revolt, providing a historical backdrop that aligns with the crucifixion of Jesus. This synchronicity adds weight to the Shroud's narrative, reinforcing its connection to a specific historical period and imbuing it with a palpable authenticity that transcends mere speculation. Furthermore, the stitching pattern serves as a roadmap for tracing the Shroud's trajectory through time. By meticulously examining repairs, alterations, and the overall condition of the stitching, researchers can piece together a chronicle of the Shroud's custodianship. This forensic analysis becomes instrumental in authenticating its historical journey and validating claims about its purported origin. The stitching pattern's role in corroborating or challenging assertions about the Shroud's authenticity cannot be overstated. When aligned with known textile practices of the time, the stitching becomes a corroborative piece of evidence, reinforcing the claim that the Shroud could indeed date back to the era of Jesus' crucifixion. Conversely, any anomalies or anachronisms in the stitching would necessitate a reassessment of its historical provenance, prompting a more nuanced and critical evaluation of its authenticity. In essence, the stitching pattern on the back of the Shroud of Turin transcends the realm of mere speculation. It stands as a tangible and distinctive feature that beckons researchers to delve deeper into the intricacies of ancient textile craftsmanship. The stitching's potential to reveal the cultural and geographical roots of the Shroud, coupled with its role in tracing the artifact's historical journey, positions it as a linchpin in the ongoing quest to unravel the mysteries surrounding this enigmatic relic. Modern scientific analyses, including carbon dating and forensic examination, play a pivotal role in shaping our perception of the authenticity and significance of the Shroud of Turin. These rigorous investigative techniques provide invaluable insights into the origins, composition, and historical context of the artifact, offering both corroborative evidence and avenues for critical inquiry. By subjecting the Shroud to comprehensive scientific scrutiny, researchers endeavor to unravel its mysteries while navigating the intricate intersection of faith, history, and empirical inquiry. Carbon dating stands as one of the most widely recognized scientific methods employed in the study of the Shroud. By analyzing the ratio of carbon isotopes present in organic material, researchers can estimate the age of the artifact with a high degree of precision. In the case of the Shroud, carbon dating conducted in 1988 yielded a range of dates spanning from 1260 to 1390 AD, leading some to conclude that the artifact originated during the medieval period rather than the time of Jesus Christ. This finding sparked considerable debate and controversy within both scientific and religious communities prompting a re-evaluation of previously held beliefs about the Shroud's authenticity. We're eager to hear your thoughts on the Shroud. Do you believe it authentically depicts Jesus, or do you consider it a mere hoax? Share your views in the comments below. Your insights matter to us. Thank you for tuning in.